Okay, could I have your attention, please? There is much to rehash, so <clears throat> I'd like to get started. Um, this, is the, this is the summary lecture, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to pull out um, some of the highlights of um, the, the digital methods theory um, as well as conceptualizations and the particular contributions that, um, that digital methods are, are making um, in, um, in the humanities as well as in the social sciences. So I'm going to go through um, each of these units and begin uh, by talking a little bit about um, just generally speaking where, where digital methods are situated. As I told you before, uh, somewhere around 2007 there was, um, it has been identified at least retrospectively, something of a turn in internet related research. Um, and that turn um, could be called uh, the computational turn, um, it could be called uh, a sort of digital a digital turn, digital studies turn, um, but, but um, what it recognized was that the web is no longer studied um, as a space apart or as necessarily um, as having a relationship with society, the relationship between the offline and the online, as some people will say, but rather <clears throat> as a data set. And I think these are the two key pieces um, the one by Duncan Watts, 21st Century Science in, in Nature, um, and by David Lazare and others <clears throat> in, um, in Science in 2009. And I mentioned um, how web data are being used to study not online culture, but rather culture or, um, or societal condition. This is the study of preference. <clears throat> so from search engine results, or from queries actually, from queries at allrecipes.com, you see a kind of distribution of taste. So this is where macaroni and cheese people are querying for in the US uh, more so than in other places. Um, this is corn casserole. Um, this year in the New York Times, uh, this, was the, this was published the day before uh, Thanksgiving. Instead of talking about trends, this talks about specificity. So you can also use search engine results um, to find, in some sense, the most uh, specific recipe query for a particular area. Um, now, there are, of course, search engine results or search engine queries, geolocated search engine queries being one source of data, online data um, that are being used. The other one are, um, that we've been talking about are, are tweets. So that's the second type. Um, so this, this one is, is, a, is a classic variation on um, the study of language, regional language differentiation, where you use um, disambiguated, disambiguated tweets to, geolocated tweets, uh, to find out where people are using which terms. Now, <clears throat> I mentioned that the seminal piece of work, and this is also um, uh, important for big data, the seminal piece of work in digital methods um, was Google Flu Trends. And Google Flu Trends, um, as you know, its biggest claim to fame was that it was able to predict the incidence of flu um, and, um, and the location of flu prior to traditional surveillance regimes from the Center for Disease Control in, in this particular instance in, in Atlanta. Um, and then this has been exported around the world. Same with uh, dengue fever. <clears throat> so what I... Um, want to talk about briefly is, is, the, is the larger question, um, and this is the question that was posed in the critique of Google Flu tr Trends, and this is the question that we posed in week one, and in some sense runs through the entire course, is that when you're using this web data, <clears throat> are you studying um, media? Are you studying media effects, or are you studying, um, um, or are you doing social research? So in the first, um, lecture, I introduced to you the kind of digital method style of reasoning nearly. So, so you start off by first saying, well, how are particular objects, uh, search engines, how are they normally studied? And then how, how can you study them if you 
um, use a kind of social research imagination and you repurpose um, the, uh, the, the medium objects and the medium devices to do social research. So with the geotag, um, if you remember, what we talked about was the fact that geotags normally are, are studied in, in a very specific way. So you see plots or markers or pointers on a map, um, and then the most where the density is is where the activity is. Um, you also study geolocated or geotagged content um, to see whether or not you can derive an alternative account to mainstream accounts of events. So you do remote event analysis. Um, you can also use it for, uh, for tracking. Um, and what I talked about was two particular projects um, on geotagged uh, work. One was using Google Images, where we asked the question, can we use Google Images to study events? Um, or are we studying Google? Um, and secondly, <coughs> um, uh, Facebook. So you'll remember this is the iconic image from the protests in Gezi Park in Istanbul uh, in 2012. Um, the lady in red, it's called, where she was pepper sprayed uh, in, during Ge Gezi Park demonstrations. Now, when we looked at the images around these demonstrations, what we found um, was that they were virtually the same, if you queried Google, over a 30 or 40 day period. Um, so Google, in some sense, um, yeah, redoes the chronology of events, uh, showing the, the most iconic images in its search engine results, instead of allowing you to follow events. Um, and this was the, the scatter plot or the, or the graphic that I, that I showed you. Um, whereas <clears throat> with Facebook, um, what we found when we were looking at Facebook pages, and this is what we'll, what we'll be doing also in the data sprint, where you'll dig into, um, into Facebook analysis, what we found uh, was that you could, um, using the Facebook posts on pages, um, you could actually geolocate activity and see where activity was going on. So, so this was the example of uh, the studying of the diaspora. And you could see which kinds of activities uh, were um, popular or most engaged with. So you can see which content animates people um, and where. So in this particular case, uh, the point was is that you are not necessarily studying Facebook but rather you're, you're doing a social research with Facebook. So you can make that sort of differentiation. Um, and the, the key question uh, is whether or not um, you can, in some sense, reduce medium effects. <clears throat> um, when talking about um, studying search engines uh, as one of the dominant devices online, and, and in particular Google. Um, Google is now, um, well, it's been sort of, it's under investigation by the, by the European Union. Um, the, the, um, the class, the, the investigations in the US uh, were, were recently dropped. But nevertheless, um, Google is, it continues to come under quite a lot of scrutiny um, because it dominates markets. And, um, uh, not only national markets, but across a number of sort of, yeah, e-commerce areas. And a lot of different critiques have arisen around Google. And, and in order to talk about those, um, what I used as a vehicle was art. And it's a, a, a media art in particular. And talked about how um, artists um, use Google critique uh, for their artworks, or as I put it, aestheticize Google critique. And when I talk about Google art, I'm, I'm, as I I'm pointed out, I'm not talk talking about these doodles, um, even though, and I have another look at this article, I'm finding it even more interesting, even though it's doodles have become the object of scholarly work. Um, this particular paper, which was published, I think in 2013, um, by uh, folks at Jacobs University in, in Bremen um, discuss uh, the function of, of, the, of the doodle um, as something actually that relates in some sense to globalization or glocalization. So taking national holidays or national 
festivities or, 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 uh, or also sort of you know, famous discoveries or famous men normally or some women um, and making doodles out of them is a, is a form of sort of domesticating, nationally domesticating the, the engine. So having the engine sort of settle into to different national cultures. The same with all the Google dot, all the top level country uh, Google, the local Google domains. So google.dk. These are all forms of globalization or in fact uh, globalization. <clears throat> but rather I'm talking about um, um, art made about Google. And, and so this was, this was the first one, uh, the crisis in Darfur. Um, now, a number of different critiques have arisen around Google. And, and you will have read about them. Um, they continue to persist. Uh, the, the one um, that is, in some sense, slightly, slightly fading or isn't as um, uh, talked about is the idea of Google um, creating sort of attention deficits, or the idea that the people only look at the top results. The reason is, is that um, Google has populated the top results with its own properties. So as you noticed when I showed you um, the, the latest sort of eye tracking, the findings from the latest eye tracking studies by Mediatif, People are scrolling down using their sort of the uh, sort of the mobile phone finger motion, scrolling down to uh, results up, uh, that are uh, below the top results, below the Google properties. So people are still looking at the top organic results, but no longer at the top of the page. So that real estate uh, is no longer as as valuable. Um, <clears throat> there have been a series of crit critiques as well about Google's um, sort of. Um, Privileging mechanisms. How, in with Google PageRank, uh, there, those either new sites or sites with alternative accounts, or other types of uh, websites which aren't mainstream, uh, are tend to be uh, lower down in the rankings. Tend to be buried, and with with the Matthew effect or with the rich getting richer, those at the top tend to stay at the top, um, and and that creates. Uh, something also known as the as as buried websites as the dark web, uh, etc. This was one of um, my favorite artworks called Schmoogle. Um, it's a commentary on um, Google's ranking behavior. So Schmoogle, when you when you put a, a query into Schmoogle, what it returns to you are randomized results. Um, <clears throat> The other one that I talked about was Google's capacity to create um, a data body, or Google's capacity to save your data and have, a, in some ways, a kind of a double, a data double of you through search engine history in particular, um, but also in your Gmail. Uh, providing targeted advertising. So Google, in some sense, um, knows you. And that has also been the, the subject of, uh, of a number of artworks. So this one, I Love Alaska, of course, it dealt with AOL, but nevertheless, showing you how intimate search engine queries are, and showing you the, the database, the, what, what was John Patel referred to as the database of intentions, your search engine history as showing your intentions. Um, <clears throat> there have been any number of reactions to this. I mean, one um, is, uh, is Track Me Not. Uh, this is a, a Firefox uh, extension which introduces sort of noise. Um, and it's also a commentary on, I don't know if you've actually, I mean, we talked about this previously, actually gone to the privacy panel in your browser um, and, lo and looked up uh, um, or even checked this particular little box that's the do not track box, uh, what um, track me not and others as well as um, <clears throat> as well as DuckDuckGo point out <clears throat> is that is that that do not track me um, feature in your browser is voluntary so companies do not have to comply to it um, and this is and this um, is um, is the way in which um, uh, DuckDuckGo uh, for example, advertise itself and also 
advertises itself by showing sort of intimate queries. Here's a query, a series of queries for herpes, uh, which Google then would save, um, and DuckDuckGo wouldn't. Uh, similarly, this is another piece of uh, uh, art. Uh, <clears throat> this is um, uh, a commentary on, on, on Google Street View. Uh, where and and what's interesting about this is th that you can also in some this is a work that shows um, individuals who have been uh, photographed uh, on Google Street View. You'll notice if you use uh, Google Street View and you see an, an image of a person, that now their faces have been uh, have been sort of etched out. Um, this was on the basis of, a, of, of lawsuits uh, and a lot of public uproar, first in Germany, and, and, uh, and it spread. It's interesting that Google has founded a research institute uh, in Europe, and the place that they decided to cite it was, uh, was Germany, where Google has gotten the, the most critique. Um, it's a couple of uh, examples. <clears throat> now, um, one of the other major critiques of Google um, is called Googleization. We talked about Googleization as a form of um, critique where you're seeing Google as no longer a new media form, where you're seeing Google instead as mass media. Um, and there are a lot of reasons to um, uh, consider Google as mass media, not only because, of, because it's taken over market after market, um, but also a couple of aspects of how we oftentimes have thought about new media as being disruptive technology. So you move into a new industry like Uber is doing right now. You move into the taxi business <clears throat> with, with, with a new media uh, model and you disrupt that industry. But what we forget um, is that in some sense, arguably, once industries have been disrupted, uh, like what Google has done, they tend to mature. So, so the, the, because the barriers of entry are so high, so Google, because it runs over a million servers, um, is, is quite difficult to replicate. Um, and, and you'll notice if you use other pieces of software and you put other, other search engines and you put the results up side by side, so Bing, uh, Yahoo, that you get sort of similar results. So, so what you're getting in some sense is a, is a, is a sort of, um, yeah, kind of mass media uh, algorithmic or media algorithmic concentration. So, the, so everyone's trying to also, in some ways, emulate, uh, emulate Google. Um, as I mentioned before, you also, we're also getting um, the standard, standardization of content, where the content um, is uh, sort of mainstream and popular content at the top. No longer are we getting at the top uh, search, engine, uh, search engine results, which are sort of alternative. Um, so so the, the idea that new media is no longer new um, is, is certainly the case with, with Google. Now, Google, Google's business models have been the, the subjects of, of critique. And, and this is some of the most uh, the famous uh, new media artworks. These are by Uber Morgan. Um, <clears throat> and the, the, the Google one was called Google Will Eat Itself. There's also Amazon uh, Noir, as well as Face to Facebook. Um, all of these pieces of software uh, are sort of, um, in, in some ways, critiques of the, um, yeah, the, the kind of corporatization of the online world. And, and the, and the fact that, uh, that particular media companies have, have grown uh, rather big. These are also rather big software projects. Uh, for example, with Amazon Noir, this project downloaded uh, masses of, of, uh, of books from Amazon, stitched together the previews, and made available the full books on the black market. That's the Noir in the Amazon Noir project. <clears throat> um, we talked about the critique of Google um, as uh, the, sort of as doing information politics, as, as in some ways um, playing along um, with with the authorities. Now, this is interest. This is an interesting critique because because um, Google, well, Microsoft and Yahoo has has been the subject of critique more than than Google, and that's because Google, um, after having complied with um, Chinese uh, uh, censorship laws 
after having complied with them, um, they decided um, to move their operations to Hong Kong. And in doing so, it was sort of public relations uh, victory in some sense, but in doing so, it was, took some kind of a stand. Um, and and, and uh, whereas uh, Yahoo and, and Microsoft um, um, did not. One of the other ways in which Google is oftentimes critiqued um, is in the way that it treats uh, links. So, so it used to be um, that on the web it was all websites were considered equal, all links were considered equal, and so one would count links, and those websites that have received the most links to them uh, from websites which themselves received many links, this is the PageRank algorithm, would rise to the top. But as of somewhere in the mid-2000s, um, Google started to recognize that there are quote-unquote spammy neighborhoods online. And through a series of algorithmic changes, um, the latest one, Panda being one of the latest one being Hummingbird, has quite um, drastically tried to reduce the effects of, um, of what they consider to be spam. Uh, so, and all the various tricks that websites, all the sort of black arts of search engine uh, optimization and search engine manipulation. Um, so, in, and then and then low and then lowering um, sites page ranks or lowering sites in the returns which are considered to be spammy. Um, and, 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 um, and of course this has had the effect that other sites that aren't necessarily spammy, um, and then one example um, that we studied was 911truth.org, um, um, this sort of conspiracy website which when you queried the term 911 was at the top of uh, Google search engine returns for years and then because of these updates uh, suddenly fell down quite, quite low, down to rank 50 or lower. Um, and the question is, okay, so, you know, conspiracy websites um, uh, can understand why they're not considered sort of top or, or mainstream, um, but they did receive the most links, uh, and, and therefore there did generate quite a lot of interest. Um, so Google pen penalized them despite their success. Yeah, we talked a little bit about licensing and the artwork, um, the whatever button. There's a lot of activity. <laughs> oh, yeah? Okay. Um, yeah, sorry, we just, we just Googled what happened. <laughs> Um, and this is the, it's an inappropriate slide to have up uh, for what just happened, actually. So let me just take that off. Uh, one of the things that's important for you to know, I think, um, is what you're agreeing to when you query Google. Um, so you're agreeing to a number of things. And uh, one of them is that you will not uh, that you will query Google only through its interface, that you won't save its results, and that you won't create derivative works of its results, those three things, um, which um, is precisely what this particular uh, work of art did. Um, this is the news map, uh, which, which showed um, uh, sort of the geography of news. So which, which news articles are gaining the most attention uh, which news sections are gaining the most attention and where are they gaining the most attention. So to do a kind of distributed, to do a resonance analysis of news as well as a distributed uh, geography. Um, we're also doing that when we, um, when we use, <coughs> when we use the uh, Litmanian device or the Google scraper. Uh, so what we're doing is in fact um, uh, breaking the terms of service. And, and what the point I want to make here, and it's an important point, is if you want to use Google as a research machine, uh, in some sense you need to break its terms of service. Um, and that would there, thereby be the sort of, the, in some sense, the moral justification uh, for breaking the terms of service. Here's another example. This is um, Google Images results re-rendered, saved, 
uh, and then re-rendered in order to make a point. Okay, um, <clears throat> we talked about studying websites um, and in particular blocked ones. Uh, and I think it's important to point out that um, the beginning of the web, so somewhere in 94, 95, 96, 97, um, there was the great promise of a new politics. Uh, and the great promise of the new politics was, was in some sense a world um, without censorship for two reasons. And they, they had to do with the architecture of the internet and what people made of the architecture of the internet. So the internet has at least two uh, principles that uh, that have appeared to be extremely important for civil liberties and human rights. Um, the one um, is uh, packet switching, uh, and the other one is the end-to-end -end principle. So packet switching, uh, according to uh, James Boyle um, in, uh, in the 1990s, um, meant that messages uh, would um, move around uh, blockages, move around malfunctions, uh, and then come back together. Uh, so the, then the end-to-end -end principles, uh, principle similarly meant that the internet was content neutral. So it was a conduit like the telephone. Um, so we would deliver the content no matter what. Now, um, 20 years later, it's no longer the case. We have something like 35 countries, at least 37 countries, being monitored for, for internet censorship. And that is, in some, that is what the Open Net Initiative does, uh, the collaboration between the Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto um, and the Berkman Center at Harvard. Um, it's, uh, it's also what, um, what we learned to do here, studying internet censorship. And, and in order to do that, we um, uh, sought to teach some skills. Uh, and the, I think the most important, well, there are two skills. Um, the one that we taught, but the first one is list building. So how do you make a list of URLs? And it's, it's non-trivial. Um, and uh, and, it, and I th it's the difference between a decent paper, a decent piece of research, and, and, and one that's not very good. Is, is how well you build, build your list and the kind of argument you have for it. The other skill, incidentally, is query design, but that's, uh, that's, that's different. Um, but nevertheless, this is, uh, this is one that we, we talked about in, it's, it's in, some, uh, in some detail. Uh, most list building techniques are editorial, um, where people make a collection of URLs. Uh, and and the, the, the the editorial model, there are normally two editorial models, kind of more or less. There's the thematic one, um, and there's the exhaustive one. Um, and what you'll notice is that the exhaustive one is, 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 is exhausting uh, in the sense that uh, if you try to find everything, um, you'll always miss something. So what one tends to do is um, have a thematic uh, approach, which then tries to find out, tries to uh, provide a sense of either uh, the top ones um, or uh, ones that are somehow related, um, that relate to one another. So this is an editorial approach. We talked about then the new media uh, techniques. So editorial approach has been around forever, but the new media ones are, in some sense, different. Um, crowdsourcing, this is one of the sort of seminal new media methods, you could argue. Crowdsourcing, unlike most other techniques, um, is something that, has lent, that, that is sort of of the medium and has lent itself to, um, to uh, uh, has come from this idea, probably this open source idea of um, when there are many eyes, bugs are shallow. Um, so the more eyes you have on a problem, um, the, the quicker it is solved. Um, and the other one, of course, is the search engine. Now, the search engine, in order to build a list, 
in some sense could be in, uh, construed as some sense of, of sort of a lazy way of doing it. Um, and if you then rely on an engine to author your list, um, oftentimes, at least your readers will ask of you, well, then how does the engine work? And because that's difficult oftentimes to explain, there, there, are, a couple, there are only a couple of things that you can say. Uh, number one, you say that, that I'm using the engine uh, because it is the, the, the dominant uh, device online and the dominant means of, of organizing content uh, online. Um, and I'm using Google because it is the top engine. So you could, you could go down that route with, with the argumentation. Um, but um, uh, because of the ever-changing nature of search engine results, because of uh, the continuing algorithmic updates that Google makes, search engine results tend to be volatile over time. So it's very important when these search engines were queried and whether you can explain what the latest uh, state of the algorithm was. So for those reasons, it shouldn't, it's not necessarily recommended. However, you can use an engine with query design. Uh, and this is the other approach. So, so, um, so through special queries, I was able to author a list. Um, and then we went in, into some detail of, of what query design is, in particular making um, lists of URLs from particular countries. Um, from the, the from the top level, but also from uh, uh, second level domains per country, and then and then making uh, you know long lists of URLs, and then saying the top URLs per country were checked, and the top URLs according to Google. The one um, um, technique that I want to spend a minute in concentrating on is the technique that uh, we developed. Uh, for the Iran uh, study that was published in 2012 um, and also has been used uh, by this particular um, um, tool, uh, Great Fire, um, the Great Fire. So what they do is they also do device studies. So they look, they, they, conca they uh, concatenate. Is the, is the word. So they, they use the results from as many devices as possible. Uh, so from engines, uh, from, uh, uh, from Alexa, uh, from other content aggregators, uh, from adver advertising tools, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then, then they put all of those URLs together, thereby creating a means to demarcate um, a national web. So this is considered to be, I mean, there are other more complicated ways and more computationally intensive ways of making a sample of a national web. Uh, but this um, one here is the one that it comes from um, device studies. Um, and I want to emphasize that you, when you do this sort of work, you can actually put your findings out in the public domain. Um, and you would do that, I mean, this is an example of a press release. Uh, I did this with a group of students. So what we did is we spent a couple of days together um, devising a technique um, to make a list of URLs and then checking those URLs to see whether they were blocked and then double checking on a series of, of proxies, um, which we then geolocated to make, to make sure that there, there was or there wasn't a, a, a regional blocking, second generation surveillance. And then we put out a press release um, saying what it is that we found. And this press release was picked up uh, by, uh, by news uh, organizations. Um, yeah, the last one, of course, was uh, that we developed here is dynamic URL sampling. So you have a list, and then you enter it into the issue crawler um, to get more, more URLs. And the reason for that is because in the list building techniques, or some of them, not the device studies one, but the editorial one in particular, you, have, you tend to have rather short lists. Um, and so how do you build out these lists and get more related URLs? Uh, well, you can crawl them. 
Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to take you through each of these individual case studies, but what I want to do for you, and you've done this also, is basically um, provide for you what are the kinds of research questions people can uh, uh, come up with to do internet censorship research. It's funny because internet censorship research seems extremely straightforward. You know, is it blocked or, not, or is, is, it, is it censored or not? Um, and in some sense, um, that's not really a re that's not an academic research question. Um, and the difference between that and an academic research question is as follows. Um, instead of asking whether particular sites are blocked, you ask, well, how effective is the blocking in particular countries? That's an academic research question. Uh, where you operationalize it uh, by um, uh, building a list um, of a, th a thematic list, um, lengthening it, and then checking to see the amount of coverage or the spread uh, that a particular country has. And, and for the Falun Gong example, <clears throat> we found that, that China basically blocks all Falun Gong web websites, that it's extremely effective. <clears throat> so it has incredible reach. Whereas, <clears throat> whereas if you look at Saudi Arabia, the question is how, you know, for, for particular categories um, uh, that are blocked for religious reasons, for example, in Saudi Arabia, how, how, how well are they doing? Um, uh, so how porous? Um, so another one is how to discover, and this is more of a methodological question, which then makes it also academic, how, um, d how to discover previously unknown censored websites. So what is the technique to do so? Um, another one is the extent to which censorship is selective is an academic research question. So for the case of the United Arab Emirates, what we did is we discovered that there are two, um, uh, uh, there were two proxies from the United Arab Emirates in the uh, internet censorship discovery tool, two different proxies, and they had, they had two very, very different IP ranges. One started with 200 and the other one started with 80 or something like this. Uh, and then when we started feeding websites through them, we saw that for one IP address, everything was blocked. And for another one, everything was OK. And this is the same country. So what's going on? So we looked into it deeper, and we found out that one was in Dubai, used by the expat community and, and, uh, and, and the wealthy, in some sense. And the other one was used by the everyday people in the United Arab Emirates. So that we found selective. Um, and therefore bias, and therefore demographically, in some ways it's sort of a class warfare, if you will. Um, the, the final one, and there are a couple other academic research questions, by the way, which uh, when I went through the discussions that we had in class about internet censorship research, and then I took the collective notes and I sent them to you, what I noticed is there, there are four or five other um, quite decent academic questions that we collectively came up with in, in, that, in that mail. Um, so have a look. So there's a, probably a, a, about nine in total um, of decent questions. Like not, is it blocked or not? But no, how do you make a... So the last one ha um, that we did previously was uh, based on the idea of the web as a, as a, as a, um, as a, a circulatory medium. So you might block content here. You might block this website that has this offensive content. But that content, or snippets thereof, could circulate elsewhere to other websites which aren't blocked. So to what extent is the web a circulatory medium or, or a circulation medium that thereby, uh, in, in a way, uh, allows for internet censorship circumvention? Um, and we found in the case of, of Pakistan um, that the content that has circulated from blocked websites is sparse. Um, and, and it's interesting, like, like, and th this uh, just occurs to me, those particular websites which are content repeaters, which take content, aggregate it, 
would be considered spammy by Google, but on the other hand, could be valuable as internet censorship circumvention websites. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I showed you this, uh, talked about this uh, previously. OK. Um, one last one before the break. The website as an archived object. Now, if you look at the history of, so, so as I mentioned before, the website is oftentimes considered to be the seminal object of study for the web. Um, it's, it, it's, to some, it's, it's what um, the TV show is to television. It's what the movie is to film. Um, Etc. It, it is the it is the, in some sense the seminal object. Now it's probably the seminal object if if you come at it from a content uh, point of view. But if you come at the web studies from an infrastructural point of view, for example, you would say something quite different. I guess uh, the search engine, for example. Um, but nevertheless, um, the the website has been uh, because from a content point of view. Um, has been considered valuable enough to save. Um, and so, so when, when thinking about um, what to preserve uh, online, one doesn't think about, well, what we need to preserve our search engine results. Well, no, first of all, it's against the term, terms of service, number one, um, or something else, but no websites. And, and there, um, it, it, when one thinks about saving websites, it's not necessarily straightforward because you cannot at any given time save the entire web. So you need an approach. Um, and what we talked about is that over the years, um, there have developed um, something like four approaches to, to saving uh, websites or to archiving websites. Um, and they are these. Um, and each of these particular approaches have implications for the kind of historical work that you can do. And this is the big insight. Um, so if you save with a particular approach in mind, it lends itself to a particular kind of history that can be written. <clears throat> so um, we went through that the Wayback Machine, which tried to save um, the whole web through a very clever crowdsourcing technique, uh, which is the Alexa toolbar. So you installed the toolbar. You got information on websites you visited. But in exchange for that information, you, you provided, you, the crowd, provided the websites, the addresses, the URLs, to be archived. Everything, that, every site that you visited uh, was logged. And the Internet Archive looked at the logs. And if they hadn't archived that website before, they would go out and archive it. So, so um, with the Alexa toolbar, they crowdsourced a list of URLs. <clears throat> and they tried to, in some sense, um, well, and then continue to do, uh, archive the entire web. And it's, you know, it, I mean, Bruce DeKell, who, 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 um, who, who started this, uh, indeed admits that it's quite a sort of crazy idea. Um, uh, but they, they go on. And, it, and it's really the only project of its kind. Um, it's, uh, it's, based in, it, it's based in San Francisco in the uh, Presidio. It's, uh, they have uh, a huge facility. It's also, there's also a way back a set of servers um, uh, in Amsterdam. So they came. I think it was about four years ago, and they hung up a banner in front of a number of servers, <laughs> took a picture um, in, at, the, um, uh, at, the, at the Amsterdam uh, data center. And so the Wayback Machine is also here uh, in town. Um, it's also in a few other places as well. <clears throat> so what's interesting about the Wayback Machine um, is that you, s you search single websites. And then so, so what it does is it, it invites you to do histories of single websites, in some sense, site biographies. It's also this sort of weird um, device in the sense that it, um, 
it has built into it the period in which it was put online and the, and the problem that it sought to solve, and that is the uh, 404, file not found. And so on the <clears throat> in the Wayback Machine, when you click on links, it brings you to a website, uh, to the links website in the archive, closest to the date. Um, and, if you, and if it's not, if there is no archived website, it, it brings you to the live web. So it allows you to surf, um, which, um, I mean, slowly, uh, but still. It allows you to surf, which you couldn't completely do uh, at the time when, th when, this, was, uh, when this was invented. <clears throat> the, um, the second uh, type of um, uh, web archiving tr tradition is called web sphere analysis. And it is um, uh, first, it was first developed by Kirsten Foote and Steve uh, Snyder um, for the study of the US elections as media events somehow, in some sense. Um, and um, whilst they were preparing for their second collection, the second election, 9 11 uh, struck. <clears throat> so they had the infrastructure in place to make a, quite a massive collection of websites related to, um, to the 9-11 uh, uh, disaster. Um, and since then, uh, the events that tend to be archived are elections and disasters. Uh, so this is where this, this came from. And if you go to the special collections at the Library of Congress, as well as at the British Library, which has developed actually uh, um, other types of collections, more thematic ones as well. But still, um, this, these are the, the, the dominant um, uh, uh, reasons, rationales for making website collections. Elections and disasters, also transitions, as I talked about, papal transition, presidential transitions. Um, <clears throat> now, the third one, I think, is the most significant one, uh, and that is what national libraries do. Now, national libraries have gotten into uh, web archiving, as you know, and, and what they did is, is is they decided to come at it in a very, very different way um, and, dis and make collections about what's important for their own nations. So we're, and this is where the most web archiving um, activity is taking place. So, so one is making the collections on the basis of what, what would be considered to be um, significant uh, for a particular yeah, nation. And, and the, the, the definition of what a relevant national website is um, was developed or co-developed in, uh, in Denmark, has been taken over in the Netherlands. Um, and that uh, is, is this, um, so websites from that country domain, websites in a particular language, so Danish, websites about things Danish and Danish people, um, and, uh, and also things of interest to Denmark in any language. And it's the same for the Netherlands. Um, so the Netherlands uh, has uh, something like 3,000, uh, or no, no, it's more now, um, um, over 10,000 sites that it's regularly logging, uh, archiving. I think I mentioned to you that, that the National Archive wrote to me, um, I think about uh, two months ago, and said, we're archiving digital methods. So it's relevant enough the website uh, to, uh, uh, to, be, uh, to be archived. Um, uh, so this is, the, this is the national tradition. And so what you, what you then have are then sort of national, national histories that come out. Um, so it's, it's, it's histories about, about the particular country. Uh, so it's a very, very specific perspective on, on what kind of media is important. Yeah, the last one, and this is very recent, um, is, I mean, you can call it autobiographical history, you can call it selfie history. Um, and this is the kind of uh, website that was considered, <coughs> always considered the most difficult to archive. And that is like Facebook pages or social media or apps, uh, things that are, that are behind the login. Um, and so how do you actually, how do you actually save them? And, and a lot of the work that was going into this was, was to make uh, videos of people using like their mobile phone, normally teenagers, and then interviewing them 
and keeping the mobile phone as well. And that's your little collection for, for, for uh, posterity. Um, but recently, uh, um, with the help of uh, Rhizome, a piece of software has been developed that allows you to um, capture, and his, this is the new technique, to capture and play back um, uh, social media sites. So one's, one's own profile. And, and, the, and the piece of artwork <clears throat> that was done um, to, to show, in some sense, the power of this software, but also to make um, uh, commentary on social media through feminist media critique is this piece of work uh, uh, called um, Amalia Ullman, um, Excellences and Perfections. And it's a commentary on um, uh, especially young girls' use of uh, social media, in particular Instagram, and a critique of um, yeah, the sort of social media um, celebrity seeking or, or uh, celebrity seeking through ex sort of exposure. Um, so these are the three, you can explore them, these are the three sort of col uh, collections that have been made um, using the software that captures uh, and then plays back uh, a particular uh, social media profile. The other project that is of importance in this realm um, and um, uh, that shows uh, what kinds of collections are being made today from social media are the selfie projects. Um, this is one that was done by, uh, by Time magazine. Uh, and this one is, is, a, is more academic. This was done by, by Lev Manovich, Selfie City. And what they did was they, um, through Instagram, they uh, captured, through querying the term selfie in geotagged uh, uh, Instagram photos from five places, from five cities, uh, Buenos Aires, Berlin, uh, Manila, I think. Uh, anyway, um, they then uh, made collections of selfies, self-portraits, um, and uh, this is what they look like. And then they studied their, their formal features. Now, this is a cultural analytics approach uh, where you take, which comes from art history, so you, so you take the, the formal, pro you study the formal properties of, um, of, of media, uh, digitized media. Um, so here we're studying the formal properties of these, uh, of, of these selfies. Um, and you see what they are. You have some demographics, but, you, but you, what you're looking at is, is the, the amount of tilt, uh, um, and in particular, the, the mood and the age, so the demographic. And, 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 and these were the sort of relationships um, that were the findings. So the, so the mood in Moscow is darker than in Buenos Aires, for example. Uh, So what I mentioned is, is that the, these collections that are being made of, of, uh, of websites are not really being used. Um, it's oftentimes referred to as the crisis in, well, the, it, it's a crisis in digital humanities generally, because digitized materials but are, are not being utilize that much. And there are a number of different projects that have been, including one that we're doing here, um, called Web Art. Uh, it's a project, if you look it up. It's a, it's a project to create tools on top of archives, on top of, of, of digitized materials, so that you, you can do different sorts of analyses of them. Um, but generally speaking, there's a, there's a, indeed, there's a crisis. I've pointed out that the preferred citation uh, for the use of collections by the, of, of uh, archived websites by the Library of Congress um, is, is, is hardly used, uh, which to me is an indication that the collections are hardly used. So in order to remedy this, what we did is, is try to come up with different approaches of how you use uh, archived websites. Um, and you, in fact, um, heroically probably, uh, were able to uh, make uh, a movie of uh, website history. Um, this is one of the techniques. So, so to, to use the Wayback Machine and, and build on its 
biographical tradition uh, and to capture the history of a website and narrate its history. And we gave you a couple of narrative forms uh, to, to use. Um, and there are other, other ones as well um, uh, that we've put forward. One is, to, is to, to make collections of existing archived websites. Uh, so use, uh, use web archives as, a, as the population, let's say, and then make collections from them. Um, and so this particular example was a collection of websites made of extremist Dutch websites. It was made by a journalist from the NRC Handelsblad, the leading newspaper in the Netherlands, serious newspaper in the Netherlands. Um, and, and through this collection making, um, the journalist was able to make a series of claims about the rise of extremism and the hardening of, of Dutch culture on the basis of studying archived websites. Um, you know, the third approach uh, that we developed um, was to um, study periods of web history, number one, so this is the early, early blogosphere. And number two, to ascertain the extent to which the collection of websites is complete. So this is a technique whereby you use a website from a particular period as the source. So a directory, for example. And this, this particular project used the Eaton Web. And the Eaton Web was a directory of blogs, a list of blogs, um, which at some point he, this Mr. Eaton stopped uh, keeping because the blogosphere had exploded. So right at that point we said, okay, that's the end of the early blogosphere and we'll use that list. So we looked up that list of URLs in the Wayback Machine and we found out the amount of websites which were still, uh, which were in the archive and which ones were missing, which is in the middle here. And then we did hyperlink analysis, historical, this is the first instance of historical hyperlink analysis um, to uh, provide information about the missing websites. Were they well linked and, and, uh, and uh, were they central? Because in this particular approach, and this is, a, this is, in, this is the, the, in some sense, the criticism that one could make of a collection making, uh, thematic collection making, or exhaustive collection making, is that you don't know um, later on, which ones were the most rel relevant ones in the, in the particular period. So through link analysis, uh, we could find out which of these websites missing ones, as well as ones that are extant, that are exi in existence, which ones were central and which ones were peripheral. <clears throat> yeah, the last one was one of our favorites. Um, to not study uh, websites as content, but instead to study them as code, um, to take the archive website as code um, instead of content. I mean, it's interesting, a lot of archive websites are missing content. Uh, images are broken, um, et cetera. It's missing stuff because it was JavaScript, because it, but you can also say, well, yeah, there might be some content missing, but maybe it's more interesting to look at uh, websites as, as code. What can we learn if we look at websites as, as archived websites as code? And what we learned uh, in particular was, was that you can use Ghostery. Um, I don't know if you install or run Ghostery. I mean, I run it on one of my browsers. It gets in the way. <laughs> if you're running Ghostery, it's sort of, you get you know, all these trackers per, per website you visit, you can hardly, um, so I use Ghostery not, as, not when I do everyday web browsing, but rather you know, when I'm doing research. Um, so what we found out is that Ghostery is a cumulative um, uh, bug collector, <laughs> specimen collector. So it, 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 it collects trackers, beacons, etc., cetera, and then, and then it just keeps collecting them. And so uh, it has old ones still in its collection. And so you can use Ghostery and go back to archived websites from you know, the mid-2000s and see the extent to which those had trackers. So you can watch the evolution of tracking on the web uh, over time using ghost, a combination of Ghostry um, and, and the Wayback Machine.
Okay. Um, yeah, so that was our, our contribution to studying the, to, the, to the crisis in web archiving and to studying the, the website as an archived object. Let's uh, take a 10-minute break. <laughs>